Hello, good morning, welcome to Chess Base Workshop. My name is Steve Lopez, I'm your host. Thanks for clicking the link and joining us. Way back when, I'll start with a story, because, you know, I'm getting old and that's how we do things when you get old. Um, when I was, about 20 years ago, I, I had a friend down in D.C. who was a chess master, and he used to travel up our way. I was living in West Virginia, and in eastern West Virginia, and he used to travel up our way, western Maryland, eastern West Virginia, to play in chess tournaments. And uh, he took a great interest in my game. He thought I, was, I had the makings of a decent player, and he invited me to take chess lessons from him. Now, the guy was my friend, but they weren't going to be free. I mean, I was willing to pay him for his time. But where the problem, I never took the lessons, and, and where the problem was, it wasn't the money was the problem. The problem was I had to drive to where he lived, and it was about an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes to get there one way. And it was not going to be possible for me to spend between four and five hours one night a week driving to D.C. to take a chess lesson for, for an hour. Um, it wasn't a money factor. It was a time factor. That was the issue. I did not have that kind of time. The beauty of what we're going to look at here, and of course, last time around in Chess Base Workshop, I went on at length as to why analyzing your own games is, is very important. So I don't need to go through all that again. But the beauty of the analysis features within Fritz is that you can run them anytime. You don't have to chunk out part of your day to run the analysis features. The best time to run analysis is while you're asleep. It takes time. Now, you can set up Fritz to analyze your games at some paltry little amount, like five seconds a move. And we have people do that, and then they write me emails and complain that the quality of the analysis isn't very good. To which my response, were I not a nice person, would be, duh. Uh, you know, if to, to get good analysis out of a chess playing engine, you have to give it a reasonable amount of time to contemplate a move. You have to, you know, five seconds a move is not long enough. You have to give it a great deal more time than that. But consequently, what tends to happen is that it takes the chess engine literally hours to analyze a game. Usually two to four hours is is about what it's going to take to get a reasonable analysis out of out of the engine. Now your mileage may vary, okay? Um, some people may have a much faster computer, have it analyze a game at 90 seconds a move, and have it only take an hour, and, and that's fine. But typically, over the years on the on the hardware that I run. Usually it's about a two to four hour process to have a engine analyze a game. The cool part though is that you can chain the analysis. You can have a program analyze more than one game overnight. But the best time to do it is while you're sleeping because you're not using your computer, you're sleeping. So why not run your computer and let Fritz do its work while you sleep and that saves you driving an hour and a half to take a chess lesson. It saves you having to chunk out an hour and a half, two hours of your day where you might be using your computer for something much more important than chess. You do it overnight and you come in back in the morning and you've got analysis. It's really cool and I'm going to show you how to do that. That's the topic of this chess based workshop. We're going to look at the full analysis feature. Now there's a couple different ways to set up full analysis. I have a game loaded. We looked at it last week. We took a real quick look at it. This is the vanilla version, the unannotated version of the game. We have it loaded on the screen. If you want to analyze a game, you go up here. You have different tabs up here at the top of the screen, of course, that will pull down different ribbons. Go to the Analysis tab, Menu, whatever you care to call it. Here's your ribbon, and there's a button that says Full Analysis. Click on the Full Analysis button, and you get this. Now, there's something missing from this dialog, and you know what it is? So nowhere here does it say how should the game be saved. Do you want to save the game into the database? Do you want to use replace game? And we've already done a chess based workshop on the difference between save game and replace game. So I'm not going over all that again. Go back and look at some of the old videos and you'll find it, okay? But it's a very important difference between the two. Save game and replace game is huge. But it doesn't ask you that here. Now, that is why I suggest that you do not start your analysis the way I just showed you by going to the Analysis tab and clicking Full Analysis. Because when the game is over, you'll have an, you know, when it's done analyzing, you'll have an analyzed game, and you know what's going to happen? I'll tell you, you're going to forget to save it. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. You're, there will come a time when you do not save the game before you close the program. You'll hit that X up in the corner, and about three quarters of a second later you'll suddenly remember that you didn't save the game and 
you will go, <gasps> and too late. And if you do that often enough, you will become a very bitter person. And I don't want that to happen. Okay. So what we're going to do is show you a different way to start your analysis, your full analysis in Fritz, where you get the option of how you want to save the game automatically. The program will do it for you. Okay. Let me show you how you do it. First of all, you open up the game list. Now there's a couple different ways to get there. The shortcut, which I have been using for years, is to hit F12, the F12 key on the keyboard, and that brings up the game list. And here we have the game highlighted. Okay, this is the one we were just looking at right here. It's got the black cursor bar on it. If you go to the top and click the database tab, as I've just done, look what you've got. You've got a little section of the ribbon that says analysis, and you have different analytical functions. And here we have full analysis. If you click on full analysis here, look what we have down here that we didn't have in the other dialogue is we have storage options, replace or append. Replace means replace. Append means save. Remember the difference between save game and replace game. If you use append, it's the same as saying save game. If you choose replace, it's the same as saying replace game. Again, if you don't remember the difference, go back and check out that previous video that we've done on it, and you'll find it there. There's a lot of different ways to tweak this dialogue. You know, there's different ways to have it analyze your game, and we're going to look at those very quickly. These are the ones that are that are not terrifically important. They basically control the output, the ones that say annotations. Verbose, if you check that, and the default is to have it checked, you get the cool little verbal comments that we showed last week, little phrases that appear throughout the game that kind of guide you as to what's happening in the game. So if you have verbose checked, you get the cool little comments. Now, after a while, some people say, well, I don't really, don't really need those comments anymore. They don't really want them. You can uncheck it and not get the little phrases. Excuse me, I just had a sip of coffee there. The other one underneath is graphical. What graphical means is, will the program put color arrows and squares on the board, or, you know, as you play through the game, will color arrows appear for emphasis? Will colored squares appear? That's what graphical means. If you have graphical checked, it is not a surefire guarantee that you are going to get these commentaries. It just is a question of whether the engine feels it's necessary to put them in for emphasis. I have analyzed games before where you put in graphical, you have it checked, and it does not give you a lick of color anywhere in the game. You don't get colored errors, you don't get colored squares. Then there are some games where it's crazy. There'll be piles of them. You know, it just depends on the character of the game and how the software feels to best tell you what it, what you need to know. And sometimes it does not put the graphics in the game. So leave it checked. It doesn't hurt anything to leave it checked. Training. This determines whether or not the uh, software will put training positions in a game. Now I want to show you it will do it. It does not do it in every game. I get emails all the time from people. I had training checked. I had to analyze four of my games. I didn't get a training question. That's true. It will only put in a training question, just like graphical, where it feels the need to do it, and typically where there is pretty much a horrible blunder. But it will do it, and I'll show you up here. I had Fritz analyze a game between my sons, and it did put in a training question. Bing, it jumped right to it, as a matter of fact. What it'll do, and unfortunately I can't, go back and show you, but when you uh, start the game, there'll be three asterisks. That is where a training question is located. Um, as you play through the game, you start at the beginning and you tap through the moves, and when you reach the training question, which it won't do now because I already closed the dialogue, that dialogue pops up and, and asks you to find the best move in that position. That's how the training function works, and that training question was put in there by Fritz, so it does work. It's just not going to do it in uh, in every single game that you play. And actually I want to be back in the uh, game list. We go back to full analysis. That's what training does. If you have it unchecked, it will not put a training question in there ever. If you have it checked, it will put a training question in there if it feels one is required. Usually there has to be a tactical blunder and a fairly serious one for a training question to appear. So what I typically find is that maybe once in every dozen or so games, maybe two dozen, I get a training question. I have master level players 
uh, email me and call me and say, I've never gotten a training question. Well, you're a master. You don't drop a knight. You know, that's not something you do in your games. So that's why you typically don't see those the training questions appear. Um, opening reference. Uh, you'll notice that when you open up a chess book or chess magazine, they frequently have references to other games. You know, you get about eight moves in, and here's a reference to a game played in Vikonzi in 1988 between Tiemann and someone, and it's all there in, in uh, another little variation you can play through. Fritz will put those in there if you wish. If you check opening reference, but if you do, you have to come down here to reference database and select a database as your reference and you just go to wherever you want on your hard drive and pick a database. I will give you a tip and that is that I have found over time that opening reference tends to work better if you have a separate database on the opening in question. In other words, I've played a game at the chess club and I played white and it was a Roy Lopez Warrell attack. Well, as white I determined that choice of opening. It's one of my regular openings so I do have a separate database on that opening on the Roy Lopez Warrell that I use as a you know all the time um, as a reference so what I do is by checking opening reference I would go here and I would select my Warrell attack database and uh, use that as the opening reference I tend to get a little more relevant uh, opening choices you know opening variations from other games by using a separate database on a particular opening then I get by using a much larger database like Mega. But it's up to you. If you want to use Mega, that's fine. Typically, though, opening reference also, and this is a little bit technical and I'm not going to go into all the explanation, but opening reference also does not work well unless the reference database has an opening key attached to it. So if, uh, and, and the commercial databases all do. Um, Mega database does, so does uh, opening uh, the opening database, correspondence database, whatever. They all have opening keys. If it doesn't have an opening key, it won't work at all. Or you may get very weird things and may throw in totally unrelated openings. So the reference database has to have an opening key attached to it as well. I don't use it very often. I don't find it very uh, very useful to me personally, but it's up to you. Erase old annotations. If you have a previously annotated game, if you check this, it'll rip out the old annotations before it begins putting in Fritz's annotations. Entirely uh, a question of personal taste. What I will suggest to you, though, is if you have an annotated game that you have spent hours annotating, if you have an annotated game out of a database that someone else has annotated and you're going to have Fritz analyze it, either uncheck this or use a work database. Take that game, copy it from Mega Database or from whatever database you have it in, put it into another work database, and then have Fritz analyze the copy in the work database. That way you're not losing the original annotations. Because erased means erased. I mean, if it takes them out they're, and you use replace down here for your storage, they're gone. You're not getting them back. So, you know, please just be very aware. This is a very important checkbox right here, the erase old annotations. Here you can control which side Fritz is going to analyze, which side's moves. You can do white or black, or you can do winner or loser. I'll tell you from personal experience, straight up, use both. Don't even fool with the other ones. Use both. And there's a number of practical reasons for this. Number one, if from a technical standpoint, I'm going to talk about hash tables here, but I'm not going to describe what they are. I mean, very quickly, what it is is Fritz keeps positions that's already analyzed in storage so it doesn't have to analyze them twice. If it hits the same position again in its analysis, it just already knows the, the analysis, it already knows the evaluation, and it uses it, and it speeds up the evaluation. That's what a hash table is. If you analyze both sides' moves, you get more positions put into those hash tables so that even though you're having it analyze your opponent's moves and you may not care about that, it will actually improve the quality of the annotation for your moves as well because more positions will be stored in those hash tables. The other thing is you sometimes get weird results. I've seen it happen once in a great while where if you are playing white pieces and you click white, you get some very odd analysis. You get some strange things that happen. It's just a quirky thing that happens once in a while. If you select both, it doesn't happen. The other thing from a tutorial standpoint, from a chess improvement standpoint, is if you have both sides analyzed, you're going to find places where your opponent probably could have kicked your butt and you both missed the move. It's going to happen at some point in some game. He's going to have an amazing tactical shot that he missed, that you missed, 
and you would never know about if you didn't have both sides moves annotated. Um, why is that important? Why is my opponent's tactical shot important? He wouldn't have had a tactical shot if you hadn't done something to give him the opportunity, or if he hadn't done something earlier to force you to make a move to give him the opportunity. Whatever, however you want to characterize it, the fact is it was there and you both missed it. It's a good idea to know that stuff. It's a good idea to see them occur, and if you see repeatedly that you're giving your opponents these opportunities, that's valuable information for you to use in determining what you need to study and where you need to improve. So I strongly urge you to analyze both sides' moves. For that reason, if nothing else, for that reason, because you're going to see ways that your opponent could have smacked you down pretty hard. Not every game, but some games, and you're going to need to know that info. Storage we looked at, replace game or save game. Append means it's going to be appended to the same database. Uh, you'll notice up here, um, you'll see where I have the game unannotated. That's the one that's currently highlighted. It's also in there again. Obviously, when I had Fritz analyze the game, I used append. So that it put a separate copy of it in the database. Here comes the big part right here. This is the huge part. The most important stuff in this dialog is calculation time and threshold. The longer you let a computer think, the longer you let this chess engine think per move or per game, the better analysis you're going to get. Now, I do not have a master chart of here's my hardware and I want to have this search depth, what do I set it for? You're just going to have to play with this and you're going to need to figure it out. But I will tell you as a general rule, the more time you give a computer to think, the better analysis that you get. The amount of time that you give it to think is going to depend on how often you need your computer and when you're going to have the computer analyze your games. I've noticed on my hardware, just this particular laptop that I do these, these videos on, that if I set it for 90 seconds a move, it takes between 2 and 4 hours for Fritz to analyze a game. A lot of it depends on the game length too. If it's some 150 move, you know, epic, it's going to take a lot longer than a 22 move miniature. So that plays into it as well. There, that's why there is no master chart. There's no hard and fast rule. But what I have found is that with a 90 second calculation time, Fritz will usually get into about roughly 20 ply search depth, give or take a couple of ply, 19 to 21. Uh, that's perfect. I remember a day when you used to have to have a computer analyzed for three to five minutes a move to get a nine ply search depth. So this is wonderful. I have no problem. I don't need it to go 30 ply. 19 ply, I'm in heaven. I think it's cool. So I set it for 90 seconds a move. I think the shortest amount of time that you should let it think, regardless of your hardware, because Fritz 12 won't run on computers that or from way, way back. So obviously I know that it has to be a certain type of computer, a certain speed. I think the least setting you should set would be 30 seconds of move. I think that, I, don't, I don't think you really want to go any shorter than that. Calculation time per game, I'm not a big fan. Uh, it's like playing a blitz game. You know, you sit there and you think and you get some really good analysis early in the game and then later in the game you're firing moves off like crazy just trying to, you know, make time control. That's kind of the way this will work. If you give it 10 minutes per game, as is the default here, um, you're going to get the, you're going to get some moves analyzed really well and then you're going to get it flying through some stuff as it, get, as it starts running out of time. Um, personally, I'd just rather let it take 90 seconds of move and let it take its good sweet time and, and give me what I want and not worry so much about... Uh, you know, giving it X amount of time per game. Threshold. This takes a little bit of explanation. Threshold is, is a number that is expressed in one one hundredth of a pawn. What it does, let me give you an example. Let me set it for 100, which you can type in. You can highlight it and type the number in as I just did. If you set threshold for 100, Fritz will not give you a suggestion unless it finds a move that is better by a pawn or more. That's what threshold means. If I set it for 100, Fritz has to find a move that's better by 100 one hundredths of a pawn, by a full pawn or better before it will give me a suggestion. So if it finds a move that's better by a tenth of a pawn, it's not going to show it to me because the threshold is set for a full pawn. Okay? 
You can set it higher if you wish. If you set it for 300, Fritz will not give you a suggested move unless it finds one that's better by a minor piece or more, by three, you know, three one hundreds, by three pawns or better. Typically, the higher you set the number, the less analysis you get back. The higher you set the number, the only thing that Fritz is going to point out is gross tactical blunders, where you're dropping a pawn, you're dropping a piece. The other extreme would be to set it for something like five one hundredths of a pawn. If you set it for that, Fritz will pretty much analyze every single move of the game and give you a suggestion for just about every move. The problem with that is, how much better is five one hundredths of a pawn really? I mean, are you going to, are you, as you're analyzing a game, as you're sitting there across the board from your opponent, are you going to see that? And the answer is no. And, and is five hundred, hundredths of a pawn better that much better that it's significant that you need to bother with it? Uh, you know, personally, I don't think so. If this knight move is almost identical in evaluation to the bishop move that I actually played, nah, I'm cool with that. I'm fine. What I said it for is this, and this was a suggestion that my friend Dr. Bob Pollack came up with, and I, I like it very much. If you set a threshold for 30, that's about roughly, give or take, a third of a pawn technically be 33.3, but we'll set it for 30. Uh, Dr. Pollack has said that, th that, uh, that three, uh, a tempo in chess, a tempo, is worth about a third of a pawn. If you lose a tempo, you've lost about a third of a pawn. And in his opinion, in my opinion, definitely my opinion, that's about as fine a distinction as you can possibly make as a human player. You can definitely notice if you lose a tempo. It doesn't lose material, but if you lose that tempo... Uh, yeah, you'll notice that I played a couple games. I remember very well a game I played at a chess club where if I had been able to make two moves in a row, there was this pawn that was threatened, and, the problem, and my opponent knew it, so he kept making threats that I had to counter, and I could never get that pawn back. And the guy sitting at the, the, the board next to us was sitting there laughing after the game, and he went, man, if you just had one more tempo, I said, I know, I know, if I'd had one tempo, I'd have won that game. You know, absolutely. So a tempo is about as fine as, as a, a human being really can split it, unless you're just a super chess machine like Capablanca. So I, I suggest 30, or if you like, 50 is another good one. That's a half pawn. Uh, you make a move that is a half pawn worse than the best move that Fritz finds. It will give you analysis of that. That's another good level. If you are a beginning player, if you're just starting out, your best threshold is 100. Basically, it will point out where you lost that pawn and how you could have prevented it. Or, or more. I mean, if you drop a, a with a setting of 100, it'll show you if you dropped a minor piece, you dropped a rook, you dropped a queen, it'll show you a better move. For players that are a little more advanced, a little farther along, I suggest a threshold of 30. Uh, and again, that's that corresponds to about a tempo. When you have set all of these options now, and it's a lot to know, I realize, so you might want to go back and watch this video again, but once you set all these options, you're ready to go. So you click OK, and I'm not going to do it here, but you click OK, and the program will begin to analyze. I will describe to you what it does instead of show you. This is going to be like those, those cooking shows where they pop a uh, cake in the oven, they go to a commercial, they come back, and the cake is done. Uh, we're going to go here, our cake is done, and this is what we have using full analysis. What you will notice, the first thing that will happen, give me a second, I need a sip of coffee. Generally, the first thing that happens is, the software identifies the opening, and it drops in an annotation that says last book move. What that does is it goes into what opening book you have loaded. In this case, I have power book as the, the current opening book that I've loaded. Uh, and it will identify where the book runs out. So this is the last move that's in the opening book. This is the first move where someone deviates. White played B3 here, which is not a recognized book move according to Fritz power book. So that's what you'll see, but you'll notice something very curious, and that is that the program will jump to the end of the game and begin analyzing the final position, and it works backwards through the game. The reason why it does that is that it's always easier to know where you're going if you know where you've been and vice versa. Uh, what Fritz does is it takes the, this information, analyzing this position, and puts it in the hash tables, and then when it backs up one move, 
then it's going as it's analyzing it, it's, it's already got a ton of possibilities in those hash tables, and some of these are going to be ones that come out of this particular position. So it's going to do a better job of analyzing working through a game backwards because it's going to store analysis, it's going to store positions and evaluations in its memory, and it just works better when it starts at the end and works backwards. So that's what you'll notice that it does. It begins at the end of the game and, and works backwards, and it will continue backwards through the game until it reaches this point, which is, which is the first move that uh, was not in the book. It'll analyze that move, and then when it backs up one more and hits the, what is annotated as the last book move, as you see here, it stops, and the game is done. It has analyzed the game. I'm not quite sure how much time this game took. I think it was about two and a half hours to analyze this game. Um, I set it up and it was down to, uh, I let it run for about 30 minutes and it was down into the 20, low 20s by the time I went to bed. So uh, it probably took about, again, about two hours, two and a half hours to analyze this fairly short 27 move game. What you will see is I had it set for, uh, for a threshold of 30. Every time Fritz offers a suggestion, for example, at this point, white plays knight a4. Fritz thought that queen d2 was better. This move is better by a tempo or more. So there may be moves that were actually even, you know, that were, that were better than uh, knight a4, but they weren't so much better that Fritz felt the need to comment. So, for example, Looking at the last book move, this is where this is the last position from the opening book where black has played knight e8, white plays 9b3. This may not be the best move in the position, but the best move may only be better by a tenth of a pawn, and we don't see that because we had it set for three tenths of a pawn. So this may not be the this may not be the best move, but Fritz isn't going to show you what it thinks the best move was because it wasn't a significant improvement over this move. This is why you don't want to set threshold really, really low, because you get analysis on every single move of the game, and some of it isn't really that terribly valuable. It's not something that's going to be that important in a game that you play. So Fritz will only show us a better move if it's better by a tempo or more. So we play through the moves, and again, we come to this fork in the road. We get the variation pop-up. Uh, White had played knight a4, but we want to see what Fritz thought was better. if. Uh, White plays queen d2, and then black develops the knight. Uh, white has a definite advantage here. It's not a slight advantage. It is a distinct advantage at this point. White's not winning, but white's doing pretty good. We go back to the regular move of the game. Black plays this. White moves his bishop to b6, but Fritz thought another move was better. Once again, developing a queen off the initial square, and then rook e8, and again, white is still ahead if that had been played. Instead, knight b6, rook a7, and now white plays bishop c5. Again, Fritz finds an improvement. This is what was actually played, but Fritz thinks that this is better. Black plays this, but notice that the mark has changed. The evaluation symbol has changed from being white has a clear advantage to white has a slight advantage. So white is starting to lose a little ground here. Um, but this is also why I like numerical commentary better than symbolic commentary because I don't know how much better or, or how much white how much white's game is starting to slide backwards here. We notice though that uh, black plays this move but black had better it says better is for this variation right here and had these moves been played black would have equalized. That's why we have a equal symbol here, but instead black plays this, but guess what? White, here we go, now we know this is a blunder. White plays bishop d7. We get two question marks. That is an outright blunder. Uh, Fritz says this is way better if you play the knight to here. Let's back up. I'll show you the actual move. Um, this would be better, and white would have kept his slight edge. Instead, White messes up the game, and in Fritz's uh, estimation, after black plays this, look at the symbol, black is now winning at this point. And we can go on and play through the rest of the game and see why black is winning. We can also see why the game turned around, because white ultimately wins this game. But that's how you basically use this. Uh, you, you're going to set it up, you're going to let it run for a couple hours, and you're going to get 
evaluations from Fritz and using full analysis you get the verbal commentary you occasionally in some games this one we didn't but in some games you get colored arrows and squares to emphasize points in the game you get training questions if there's an outright gross piece dropping blunder you will see a training question appear in the game um, you will see verbal commentary if you choose to display it and the cool thing about the verbal commentary letting the wind out of his own sails is not necessarily that useful from a chess standpoint but what it does is it points out that something happened here and if you look you see two question marks which you may have missed if you just look at this notation if you just glance at it uh, what you see is important points of the game get verbal commentary so you look for that verbal commentary you know something's going on there that's why I call them guideposts or pointers in the game so that's how you do it I will show you one more thing before we leave for the week and that is this if you have more than one game you would like to have analyzed okay now the way you would do it is hold down the control key on the keyboard and highlight the games that you wish to have analyzed you can highlight more than one game and when you click full analysis and set up your parameters here it will apply to all of these games and all three of those games will be analyzed in order it's it, it basically chain them so when it finishes analyzing one game it will now analyze the next game and when it finishes analyzing that game it will analyze the following game and you can set up as many of these as you like just be aware again it depends on how long you're not going to be using your computer typically because it takes two to four hours to analyze a game if I'm crashing out at 11 o'clock at night and I don't need my computer till 9 o'clock the next morning, I pretty much can safely analyze three games. Once in a while, if it's a real long game, if it's some Ben-Hur epic 125 mover, and you get a couple three games like that, you may wake up, get up, get to your computer about 9 a.m. and find out that it's only analyzing the second game or it's, it's only partway through the third game, and you may have to manually stop the analysis. You can do it. I'm, again, I'm not going to start analysis to show this to you, but while Fritz is analyzing a game, while it's in the process, up in the upper left corner up here, there will be a, a button you can use to stop it. So you're not locked in. If Fritz is analyzing a game and you suddenly need your computer for whatever reason, reason you can stop Fritz's analysis and you can get back in and use your computer for non-chess purposes if, if that uh, is required but do keep in mind that the cool part about this is you don't have to drive two hours to another city to take a chess lesson uh, you can have Fritz and, and typically a lot of chess lessons that's kind of how they work is you uh, you bring a game to your instructor and he will pick it apart that's perfectly that's wonderful that's great that's what you need you need that feedback but if you can't spend five hours driving to another town and back to take a chess lesson you can have Fritz overnight in a space of five hours analyze a couple of your games and as I've said before over time you will see patterns emerge in your games you will see where uh, you're doing things wrong and you will see where you need to guide your study what you need to concentrate on what you need to key on to become a better chess player now that was full analysis that was with the verbal commentary there's also a numerical commentary form that's called blunder check and that's what we're going to look at in the next chess based workshop until then have fun <laughs>